All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day today. We thank you for this opportunity that we have uh, to share your word and to hear from you. And Father, we just pray that you'll be with us at this time. Open our ears that we might hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts that they might receive your word and your truth as it, as it is uh, brought to us this day. We thank you, uh, Lord, for being with us, and we ask all this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so we have reached chapter 19, speaking truth to tyranny, speaking truth to tyranny. So uh, we think about uh, what is taking place in the world today, also what's taken place also from the very beginning. Uh, I could go back and uh, show you know things from the very beginning of what has happened, but as the Ecclesiastic says, uh, I, I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun, and look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors there is power, but they have no comforter. So in the first seven verses of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, uh, the prophet revealed uh, that the uh, Messiah the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace, uh, that he, he would um, come at a time when deep darkness covered the earth. And we see also in the final hours of the Son of God upon the earth, uh, how he came in a, at a time in the deep darkness that was there at the moment of his, of his uh, crucifixion in his final hours there, upon the earth, uh, the, the uh, uh, Son of Man really kind of set example for all believers everywhere from, from the beginning, uh, how, to, uh, uh, how to survive or how to uh, conduct themselves when they are living under the iron-fisted, tyrannical regimes uh, that are hostile to our faith and hostile to God. The grace and courage that Jesus displayed while being tortured to death, uh, has inspired countless Christians throughout the ages who have faced similar ordeals and similar trials uh, to, um, to stand with the same uh, dignity uh, and faith that Jesus had uh, when he was in his most, um, most uh, critical hour, when he was completely defenseless against those who had come against him. It is only natural for those who are oppressed who feel the, that their pain will never end at the, at the time that they're going through that oppression. But when we reflect upon the sufferings of Jesus, uh, we can take promise or take comfort in the promise that Jesus gave that although God's people may not be spared uh, from having to suffer uh, some kind of persecution, uh, or oppression from the wicked, uh, that if they remain faithful to the Lord until the end, he will deliver them from the grave. Therefore, we are not to be, not to be fearful of, of, of these men. So continuing on in John 19, uh, in these first five verses, the story continues. So Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they uh, put him on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to him, them, Behold the man. So as the, the story has continued, of course, we know how the Jews, we saw how the Jews delivered Jesus to Pilate uh, for the purpose of being crucified. They brought him there and that he might be killed. And they wanted to make sure that Pilate, uh, Pilate uh, did the dirty deed for them. But uh, Pilate uh, uh, saw very clearly that Jesus was innocent. He had not broken any Roman law. There was no reason for Pilate to uh, to uh, 
uh, condemn Jesus to this horrible death by crucifixion. So uh, Jesus, so Jesus was basically um, uh, beaten and abused and just beaten within a, uh, an inch of his life by these guards, these Roman guards. And Pilate thought that you know if, if you bring it out to the people, maybe they have sympathy on him. But if if Pilate thought for one minute that after seeing Jesus brutally scourged from head to toe and his humanity stripped from his body by the ruthless Roman soldiers, he, he thought for one, if he thought for one minute that the crowd would have uh, pity on Jesus and would cry out for mercy for him, uh, Pilate was sadly mistaken on that. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the fate had already been set uh, for Jesus. Uh, and again, we see, therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate, Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him. I find no fault in him. And the, the Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more, the more afraid. And he went in again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to them, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate thought, sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. So this entire episode, this moment of Jesus, uh, the, final, the final judging of Jesus, uh, it, this whole episode just overflows with hypocrisy from the Jewish leaders. You know, Pilate's sense of justice was really offended at this point because, because Roman law, although it may have been brutal against those who were found guilty, uh, you still had to be found guilty by Roman law. And uh, it was obvious uh, that the Jews have, were, uh, were, were wanting to use Rome as their executioner. So, uh, and, and it was very clear, the hypocrisy was also clear in, in the words that they were speaking, because, you know, these Jews loathed Rome. They uh, refused to accept Roman law. At, at you know any opportunity they had to go against Roman law, they they felt that the the, the Jewish law should supersede Roman law. So uh, it was it was clear that if Jesus was guilty under Jewish law, which he was not, he was still guiltless under the Roman law. And so the Jews wanted to subvert this Roman law. Uh, by demanding Jesus be crucified by Rome for something that he was found innocent of doing. But when the Jews said that uh, Jesus claimed to be the son of God, it's like it, it changes Pilate's whole attitude at this point. Uh, it, you know, he, he could no longer feel that he was indifferent to what was going on because, you know, the Romans and the Greeks, the, these pag pagan religions, uh, they contained all kinds of stories of sons of God that were the progeny of, of a human parent and a God. And uh, so if Jesus was truly a son of God, at least as Pilate would understand a son of God to be, uh, then Pilate was felt that he might be getting in over his head by unjustly ordering Jesus to be crucified. You know, Pilate didn't want to unleash the wrath of one of the gods against himself, uh, against himself, if he killed the Son of God. So Pilate was a little bit nervous at this point. His superstition uh, about uh, about the deities would have at least caused him to back off here at this point, uh, and and so he goes in. Uh, so he goes, uh, he goes back into Jesus. Now remember, the Jews are outside the Praetorium. They, 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 they want to maintain their the, the law, the Jewish law, by maintaining their purity and not and not 
entering the house of a Gentile, which is kind of, the, again, that hypocrisy and that irony of all of it, that they want to keep the, the, the whole law here by not defiling themselves with, by going into a Gentile's home uh, during this time period, but yet they, they defied Jewish law all the way through in all of Jesus' trials and just in delivering Jesus to be crucified. Uh, so when you reflect back on uh, all the statements that Jesus had made uh, to the Jewish authorities, you know, at this point when Pilate asked Jesus, uh, where are you from? You know, he's asking him, Jesus, about are you from the gods? Are you from the, are you from uh, from a heavenly realm? Uh, and G Jesus, of course, at this point, it, it would have been easy for him to say what something like what he had also already said to the to the Jewish authorities at one of his uh, times in in uh, at the temple when Jesus said to uh, uh, said to uh, the Jewish authorities, he said, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are from this, or of this world, I am not of this world, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. But Jesus said nothing like that. He made no attempt whatsoever at this point to defend himself uh, against these uh, ac accusations. But once again, we see how Jesus is fulfilling another prophecy uh, from Isaiah 53, 7, which says, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So at this point in time, Jesus is not defending himself. Uh, and uh, he's not fighting for his life at this point, uh, because again, he's already settled that, that this, you know, his life is to be given as a ransom for sin, for the sins of the world. So again, so Pilate's upset that Jesus isn't speaking to him, and he reminded Jesus at this point, hey, you know, I have the power of life and death over you, Jesus. But um, at this point in time, Pilate only had the illusion of control because the Jewish authorities have been making certain throughout the day as they've been manipulating the crowds and, and stirring up the mob against Jesus uh, they had really had taken control over the whole situation. Pilate uh, was really powerless to, to stop from what was taking place, what was going to happen here. Uh, so uh, uh, Pilate would have to bend to the, to the uh, demands of the mob at this point. And so Pilate really couldn't, at this point, spare Jesus' life, although he thought he might, although he thought he could, uh, uh, at this point in time, it was too late. Uh, Jesus the uh, was was basically uh, being held up as a as a pawn or a, a, in this power struggle between the Romans and the Jews between Roman law and Jewish law between the power of Rome and the and the and the power of the of Jewish or Mosaic law. So uh, Jesus' response to Pilate really kind of contrasts the power of heaven with the earthly, worldly power that would be, of course, of Rome. And, and Jesus looks at Pilate and says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you, to you from above. Now, of course, there's a, a dual meaning to these words because Pilate, as a Roman governor, as a Roman authority, he would look to Rome and to the power in Rome as the power above him, that would, that would be the power that, that he would be responsible to. But Jesus is speaking of a power that's even above the power of Rome, that is above and beyond Rome's power. So you can see this, this, this clashing of, of these two powers taking place. Uh, the power of God from heaven and the earthly power of Rome, which is which was considered the greatest power on earth at that time, and, and Pilate being a representative of that. And of course, Pilate, as being a, a someone from Rome, as being a Roman, he would understand that uh, that power 
to him, it would immediately identify in his mind as being an earthly power, the power of the Roman Empire, the power that came down from Caesar and the Senate in Rome. Uh, but by this time, uh, of course, the, the Jews refused to listen to any of Pilate's arguments for releasing Jesus. And uh, the more that Pilate tried to save Jesus at this point, the more the crowd pushed him to crucify him. So, you know, Pilate finally realizes how hopeless the situation is after Jesus refused to plead for his own life. If Jesus wasn't going to uh, uh, plead for Roman uh, mercy uh, at this point. Um, if he was not willing to stand up for himself, Pilate was basically had his hands tied uh, concerning uh, the Jews, and uh, the Jews had uh, uh, were demanding Jesus uh, uh, his crucifixion, his death, and at the at, and it was really you know this is so bizarre that the that that Jesus that they, they were saying that Jesus had to be crucified because he spoke against Caesar. Um, but, uh, you know, the Jews never wanted to be friends of, of Caesar. They shunned Pilate. They shunned Caesar. They didn't consider Caesar to be their king, the king of the Jews, rightful one. And uh, so they were so desperate to have Jesus crucified at this point that they were actually threatening Pilate with being named as an enemy of Caesar if he did not side with them, the enemies of Caesar, and have Jesus executed. It's just really bizarre what's going on here, this, this whole hypocrisy of this entire scene uh, as everything is getting uh, turned upside down and inside out as they are uh, the, as the Jews at this point are willing to do or say anything to get Jesus crucified. And, and of course, you know, the Herodians, uh, which we already went over, Herod and, and Herodians, who were not Jews, and they, they were the usurpers of, and were not the rightful king of the Jews. Herod was not the rightful king of the Jews. So them, and, the, and they were resented by the Jewish authorities, by the Sanhedrin, the, the uh, scribes and Pharisees, and and uh, the, the um, priests and the temple and all that, they all despised Herod and the Romans. And the Romans despised Herod. Uh, they looked down upon Herod as, uh, as being just somebody who was in the paid employee of, of Rome. Uh, Herod was in power because of Rome. And the minute the, that Rome withdrew its support for Herod, he, his, whole, his whole family would collapse. And, his, and so... So the whole thing was these three groups that were all competing against one another and all hated each other. They all unite at the end to bring about and engineer the death of Jesus Christ. So, of course, the truth that none of them could see uh, was that not, not one of them really had the power to destroy the Son of God unless it had been given to him by his Father from above. You know, Jesus had, had previously stated and made it very clear that he was the good shepherd who would come to lay down his life for the sheep. And that, uh, he, as he had said, uh, that he had come uh, and the father uh, was with him. The father uh, loved him and that Jesus was coming to willingly lay down his life uh, for the sheep that he could, again, take it up again. But of course, nobody really understood what Jesus was saying at this point. You know, if Jesus had not willingly laid down his life at this point, there was no power on, uh, on earth that could take it from him. So it's Jesus himself who's laying it down, laying down his power uh, and so that he can take it up again in his resurrection. Of course, none of these words were understood. Uh, by the Jews at this time, which is understandable. How could they understand it? You know, we've had 2,000 years to digest all this and say, oh, yes, it's pretty obvious what Jesus was saying. But at that point in time, they were, they, they couldn't have understood. I mean, this stuff would have just gone right over their head uh, and couldn't, they couldn't understand it. So, uh, so Jesus, you know, adds to, uh, to Pilate and talking to, and discussing his guilt uh, Pilate's guilt is saying uh, that uh, he who delivered me to you is the one who has the greater guilt. 
and so um, and so the pilot and the Jews they were were in conflict against each other, but yet they had to uh, the Jews needed pilot uh, to to get Jesus executed. And uh, Jesus was making it very clear at this point in time that he was not excusing Pilate or Rome or the Jewish leaders for their participation in murdering the Son of God. All were responsible. They all bore the guilt, some more than others, but certainly they all bore the, the responsibility. And they, uh, Herod was as guilty of making a mockery of the justice and not caring if Jesus lived or died. Uh, he was, he was uh, responsible. Pilate was responsible for his decision in the end to bow to the political pressure and to bow for the pressure of the mob. And, uh, and so he was guilty uh, of, uh, of Jesus' execution. And uh, Caiaphas and the other religious leaders, they were guilty of a, a much greater sin because they were the one that premeditated this, uh, the, the, the death of Jesus. They were the ones who orchestrated Jesus' murder from beginning to end. They were the ones behind all of this, manipulating the crowds and stirring up the mobs against Jesus and pointing the accusing fingers at him. So they had the greater guilt in this whole situation. And so it comes uh, down to the the end when you know when Pilate heard uh, that saying he brought Jesus out and he sat in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour he said to the Jews, "Behold your king." that they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. But is that word right there, that just drips with hypocrisy and with irony, because that would be, I mean, the, the, the Jews would never have accepted Caesar as their rightful king. Only a one who came from the line of David would have the right to be their king. And they knew that and they believed it in their scriptures say, said it. And yet here they are declaring their loyalty to Caesar of all people. Then uh, of course, uh, he, Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha. Where they, ex where they crucified him and the two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. So it was uh, this you know, final, we see a lot of really uh, irony in the closing moments of this last trial uh, as Pilate sat at a place called the pavement where Roman justice and power was implemented. Uh, of course, the pavement we think about in the last days of the second coming of Jesus, where he sits in the judgment seat. So here, Pilate sitting in the judgment seat over Jesus, over the Son of God. And, he, you know, he presented to the Jews this beaten, bloodied, and tortured body, the Son of Man, with the words, behold your king. Of course, and the Jews are saying, oh, you know, Caesar is our king. Uh, how how you know it's like how can you be so far away from from everything that you believed in order to do this to make that statement edersham uh, a guy by the name of alfred edersham who, who wrote some wonderful uh commentaries on the scripture he he said this he said with the cry with this cry judaism was in the person of its representatives guilty of the denial of god of blasphemy and apostasy those who sent Jesus to his death were guilty of everything Jesus was accused of, but he, but Jesus was innocent of doing. So the guilty ones are passing judgment upon the innocent one here. So John's narrative is succinct at this point and at this moment. 
when Jesus was crucified, when he was being led away to, to crucify, be crucified. But the other gospels, they, they include descriptions of the procession to Calvary. Uh, they, uh, you know, talked about how Jesus washed his hands of the whole affair and, uh, and uh, declared himself innocent of Jesus' blood. Uh, but of course, it was all in vain. The soldiers prepared to take Jesus to the place of the skull. You know, they stripped him and they put on this royal robe over his shoulders. It was probably, it was probably the robe that, uh, you remember when Jesus was before Herod and they were mocking Jesus and trying to provoke Jesus to perform some kind of trick for, for Herod uh, to prove that he had divine power. And Jesus, of course, would have none of that. And so they beat Jesus and then they threw this royal robe on Jesus, um, either red or purple, we're not sure exactly, somewhere in between there, uh, threw this robe on Jesus, and they carted him back to, to uh, uh, Pilate, where Jesus, again, was, uh, was uh, abused and beaten. Uh, but uh, so uh, Jesus is, of course, being, had been mocked by the Roman soldiers. They had put the crown of thorns on his head at this point. So all these things, you see, that's why you have to read all four Gospels uh, and put them together and collate them, put them together so that you can get a much fuller picture of everything that was going on. Uh, John did mention the two other cr criminals uh, that were crucified with Jesus, but he does not include the words that passed between them at that time. So uh, John's, again, John's focus and John's purpose in writing his gospel was presenting what Jesus had said and declared about himself as the son of God. So he's not really going through a lot of these things uh, uh, on that in order to keep moving his narrative forward to, to where he wants to take his readers in the end. So of course, John focused on the reaction of the Jewish authorities to the notice that Pilate ordered being fastened to the cross, declaring uh, Jesus uh, to be uh, declaring Jesus uh, to be the son, of the uh, the King of the Jews. So, uh, as he declares uh, that Jesus was the King of the Jews by putting that on there, I guess in, in a way mockingly doing that, uh, that uh, and also showing. Caesar's power over over the Jews and over any and over their authority and their laws. Um, it was all uh, it was all uh, pretty much a, a, an insult to the Jews. Not so much that Pilate was acknowledging Jesus as King of the Jews, but in that uh, in all of that, uh, there is also just this prophetic message, of course that. Uh, Jesus, uh, because it was written in Aramaic and Greek and Latin, which were the uh, Aramaic, of course, was the common language of the of the of the Jews, the de the, the dialect that the Jews spoke um, uh, uh, on a daily basis. And Latin, of course, was the the language of Rome, and Greek was the universal language, and it would have been the preferred language of Herod because Herod was. Herod and his court and the um, and the aristocracy of the Jews would have been Greek educated. So, of course, they would have known Greek. But if you think about all of this, the sign was intended uh, to inform all those who gazed upon Jesus' crucified body that uh, Rome had the power to, to make or break anyone who rivaled Rome's authority. But we can see that unintended message, that transcendent message, that prophetic message that comes through in what, and that this sign, this declaration that Jesus um, Nazareth is king of the Jews is a universal message and it will be taken to every tribe and every tongue and every language across the world. So it was, it was also uh, prophetic uh, that Jesus' uh, sacrificial death and, it would, and that message would be taken to the world and told to all the all the, the peoples of the world. But there's a lot of eschatological uh, implications, and all of this is taking place here. Uh, and we see we see that uh, 
uh, these things that are taking place in the final hours, it, it's really kind of all changed or reversed in Revelation. We see uh, a pilot sitting on the judgment seat to condemn to condemn Jesus, and, and and him, as I already mentioned before, that was a reversed in Revelation 14, 6 through 7, uh, where you see that Jesus is the one who brings judgment to the world. And in the end, it will be, uh, it will be him who will bring judgment. Uh, and uh, so that, so you see that, that reverse there in Revelation. Uh, there's also, uh, we see there are, there's an eschatological uh, significance to Jesus being lifted on the cross with his bloodstained robe uh, which was used to mock the king of the Jews. The sign proclaiming him king of the Jews is a reverse of Jesus in Revelation 19, 13 through 16, where Jesus is seen clothed with a robe dipped in blood, uh, followed by the armies of heaven and coming with a rod of iron to strike the nations. And so here we see, again, you, bat, you, you see that sign up above Jesus, above the cross, uh, declaring him to be king of the Jews. Uh, and in the end, in Revelation, he is declared king of kings and lord of lords, and uh, that he is the one that will bring that uh, the wrath uh, of, of Almighty God upon all those who, uh, who fight against him and turn against him. So, uh, and, and again, as a, another example uh, where we can see these these uh, these uh, end times, uh, end times into the world uh, um, events taking place, being reflected in all of this is the, of course, the image of the soldiers at the foot of the cross. Uh, they're there, they're there, they're gambling for the robe of Jesus, and that's a reverse of the image of the uh, of the of the of the Lamb of God in heaven uh, in chapter five of Revelation. Uh, and it's the one who was slain and, and, and redeemed uh, us to God by the blood out of every time, tribe and tongue and people and nation. So, of course, uh, we see also uh, that in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 is reflected in those words that Paul had wrote. Uh, and, uh, and so we see that uh, how they were sealed uh, uh, by that, the blood in, in, the, in this whole uh, uh, prophetic uh, uh, image that's going to be played out in the events to come at the end of the age. So the now John's narrative, of course, continues, kind of changes uh, his focus here to those who stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, uh, mother uh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of Marys because the, that was very popular and very common name at the time. The Jewish was actually Miriam. That's the Jewish uh, rendering of Mary. So there were lots and lots of Miriams around there. And uh, we see Mary, the wife of uh, and Mary Magdalene and his mother Mary uh, were three of the women who were named there. Uh, and Jesus, of course, seeing his mother. Uh, and the disciple whom he loves, standing by his mother, of course, we know that to be John, uh, he said to his mother, a woman, behold your son, and then to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now the vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on his sop and put it on his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So there's all kinds of images that uh, we see here at this final closing moments of, the, of Jesus' life on this earth. Uh, in, the, in the prophecy of Isaiah being fulfilled uh, in the Roman soldiers gambling for uh, the clothes of Jesus probably was that robe, that uh, royal robe. It would have been an expensive cloth. It would have been out of expensive material because after all, it did come from Herod, uh, from his court there. So if it wasn't Herod's robe, it was certainly the robe of one of the aristocrats that were there around Herod. So it was a princely robe and it was probably worth some money, which is why they didn't want to tear it and why they, they uh, gambled uh, for it. 
uh, without damaging it. So the, um, of course, you you see that it just told that whole indifference that they showed there. And uh, Jesus, of course, had warned his disciples of the world's hatred for him and all who followed him. Uh, and uh, but that what would be more tragic would be the countless, countless mer uh, multitudes of people like these soldiers who, you know, the seed of the gospel falls upon their callousness of their hearts and those who live too close to the world, the, world, the seed of uh, the seed of the word uh, will just fall on, on hardened hearts. And so it was with these soldiers. They did not understand uh, the significance of the moment where they were. And uh, of course, we see that uh, uh, that uh, not everyone um, uh, uh, that abandoned Jesus at this time. There were there were those who were named who were still willing to stand by Jesus at the very end of his suffering. And uh, so uh, there's there's several other things, uh, of course, going on here. Uh, so. Uh, we see that those who, who were motivated by materialism, like the soldiers at the foot of the cross, uh, they uh, really had uh, consumed by their uh, struggle to gain more. And like so many people, they turned their backs on Christ and they missed the significance of what his, his uh, crucifixion was all about. And uh, so, and there, uh, like I say, there are always a few who are willing to stand by uh, Jesus until the end, no matter what it might mean to them and their suffering. And uh, uh, very few are willing to uh, stand by until the end, but uh, those who stand by to the end uh, will, will be those who will uh, be remembered uh, by him. So we are never told why Jesus entrusted his mother to John uh, instead of one of Mary's other sons, but it is not unreasonable to speculate that John was chosen because he was close to the master and he was loyal to him to the very end. He was there at the end along with his mother, comforting her in her time of, of, uh, of great need. And of course, the bitterness of the sour wine at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry can be contrasted with the sweetness of the water that was turned to wine that, uh, at, the, at the wedding at, at the marriage of Cana. And that symbolized, that symbolized, uh, symbolized the beginning of, of his public ministry. So what began as the promise, the great promise and the hope of the nation of Israel uh, to receive their long-awaited King and Messiah, it very quickly soured. And by rejecting their Lord and Savior, the old wide skins burst and this world could, uh, all this world was, could offer was bitterness and death. So the sweetness, as I said, the, the sweetness of the water turned to wine was a sign that said it is beginning, this ministry the, that was beginning. And the bitterness of the wine-soaked sponge at the end was saying it is finished. It's at the end, uh, of course. And then Jesus bowed and gave up his spirit. Uh, John's narrative does not uh, follow uh, the events that immediately or does not talk about the uh, events immediately following Jesus' death on the cross, uh, the earthquakes, the, the, uh, the other uh, supernatural events that occurred at that time, uh, the full account, again, as I said, of, of the final three hours of Jesus' life, uh, you'd have to look at all four Gospels and combine those, those uh, Gospels together to get the fullness of the story from that. Uh, so we see now in John, John quickly moves on from there, and he changes the scene. He cuts away from that bloody scene at Golgotha, and he tells how the Jews uh, uh, hypocritically uh, appe appealed to Pilate to hasten the deaths of those being crucified. Uh, and, of course, this is not being done out of compassion, but it was done so that the Jews could move forward with their Passover rituals. They wanted to get this out of the way get it over with, get it done with, get the deed completed so that they could go on and celebrate their Passover feast. Uh, and so the, uh, again, the irony of this is that the, 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 these legalists had, had 
ignored and had um, had sidestepped every law uh, that would have prevented them from engineering Jesus' execution. They broke their own laws. They broke their own requirements for their own uh, trials to be held and handed Jesus over to a Gentile for judgment and persecution. All of this was against the Jewish law and what they uh, what they should do. But again, Jewish law required that the bodies of executed men should not be left hanging over in the, in the, in the Sabbath. They didn't want any of that uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, spoil the or defile that Sabbath day. At the same time, I think there might have been partially that they wanted just to remove any reminder from their guilty conscience of what had been done. Uh, so a pilot, of course, at this point, he, I don't think he cared less one way or the other, but he said, okay, you know, go ahead and finish them off. Uh, the method of crucifixion was, of course, designed to maximize the pain and suffering of the person who was crucified. And it could take the condemned prisoner, it could take him several days to die, two or three days to die on the cross. So he would die of the pain, the loss of blood, uh, dehydration, uh, and all of that would bring about a very slow and very painful death. Only in circum certain special circumstances would they hasten the death of the crucified by breaking their legs, because the only support they had for their body to keep breathing was their legs. They push up on the nail that was holding their legs to the cross. They would push up on it, and that would allow them to breathe. Uh, and, but once the leg was broken, once the legs were broken, they could no longer push up and breathe. So they would very quickly hasten their death by asphyxiation. And so they did that to the other two prisoners that were crucified with Jesus when they came to Jesus. As we all know, he was already dead. And so they did not break his legs. Uh, they pierced uh, his side with a spear to prove, to demonstrate that he was dead. Uh, they knew that a dead person who had died um, by that method of crucifixion, that they would see the um, fluid from the lungs would come out with, when they were, when they were uh, pierced, when the lungs were pierced. So, uh, of course, John testifies to the fact that the blood and the water came out. That meant that Jesus had already died. There was no, he didn't swoon, he didn't faint. Uh, and they take him to the tomb, and then he, they revive him. No, he was dead. And uh, so John uh, confirms that. There's, there's no room for any doubt there. But all of this, again, confirms more prophecies uh, uh, concerning the Messiah. Uh, you have, uh, of course, Psalm uh, 3420, uh, where it says, He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken, uh, Zechariah 12.10. Again, that was a Messianic prophecy from the Psalm and Zechariah. Uh, again, um, talks about the one that they would pierce. Yes, they will mourn him as the one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieved for a firstborn. So again, you see that Jesus was pierced. His bones were not broken. These are prophetic um, verses concerning the Messiah. Uh, and of course, also, uh, we look forward to, uh, or we look behind to uh, Exodus uh, 20, 12, 46 and Numbers 9, 12, uh, which say the Passover lamb is not to have its bones broken in the process of uh, being prepared for the Passover and eaten then. So Jesus, uh, as the Passover lamb, uh, only further uh, affirms him as the Passover lamb by his bones not being broken. So the, uh, we see this is continuing on, of course. They take the body of Jesus down. Uh, they mentioned Joseph of Arimathea there. Uh, and uh, it also, uh, he, uh, goes to, he goes to Pilate uh, along uh, also with Nicodemus. They both go to Pilate. And of course, they are, they are risking being singled out by the Jews. Uh, and uh, but they go and uh, they take the body of Jesus 
and they go to prepare him and put him in a tomb, lay him in a tomb. Now, you know, of course, all, go all four Gospels mention Joseph of Arimathea's act of devotion to the crucified Lord. Um, the futures of those who were identified as followers of Jesus were still in doubt at this point. You know, nobody really knew when, the, when once the Passover was, was finished, would these people be hunted down? Would they be also rounded up? Would they be killed? Uh, so, uh, again, you remember I mentioned that the Jews didn't have any problem with putting somebody to death for blasphemy, as you know, the stoning of Stephen and uh, other, uh, they tried to kill Paul on more than one occasion, and other Christians were, uh, were attacked, uh, beaten, and even killed by the Jews. So, it, the reason why they wanted the Romans to kill Jesus was really, there were several factors involved in it. One, this was in the middle of the Passover, so there were a lot of people there at that time, and the Jewish authorities didn't want to risk the crowd turning against them by being the ones who called for his death. They couldn't trust the crowds to turn on Jesus at that point. It took a long time of, of in uh, and and six trials, uh, and Jesus being beaten and bruised and paraded before the crowds uh, all day long, uh, before the crowds were were stripped away from him and turned turned against him. So, uh, and and we had seen in times before, two or three times before, when the uh, Sanhedrin or the Pharisees had ordered the arrest uh, and for the execution of Jesus. Uh, where Jesus walked away. So they didn't want to risk any of that at this point. So the, that was their, their reasoning behind, um, behind what they were doing there. So the followers of Jesus, and of course we'll read about that in the early chapters of Acts, that the followers of Jesus um, would be, uh, would be uh, suffer persecution at the hands of the Jewish authorities. So we go back, of course, to what's taking place here uh, for the burial. The burial, uh, they didn't have time to do the full burial rites and do everything that the Jewish law required according to the Jewish uh, law for the preparation and burial of the body. They had specific things that had to be done. Uh, so they, they weren't able to finish that before, uh, properly finish it before the Sabbath began. Remember, the Sabbath day begins at nightfall at at the end of the day. So when the sun goes down on Friday, that's the beginning of the Sabbath. And it will go from sundown to the sundown of the following day. So, uh, so Jesus uh, uh, is being laid in the tomb and by, uh, by uh, Joseph and Nicodemus. And no doubt they had other people, servants to help uh, to do this. The women uh, would have followed from a distance. They, they would not be able to be involved at this stage in the preparation and burial of the body. Uh, so they, of course, we know that they plan to return after the Sabbath with the spices and the perfumes and everything that, that was supposed to be done to prepare the body uh, at the end. Uh, because, you know, as the body began to decay, uh, it would begin to make a bad smell. So they like to put a lots, of, uh, lots of perfumes and oil, anointing oils and things like that, try to keep the odor down. And so they would be returning after the Sabbath to do that. And uh, so that was really kind of, we see in the, this uh, closing out of this chapter here, uh, you know, really depending upon where the, they, they live to one degree or another, uh, it has been necessary for every generation of Christians uh, to withstand tyrants uh, and or mobs who hated them. Uh, in our century, the forces of hate and ignorance against Christians are increasing on a daily basis. Uh, research is being done around the world uh, by uh, different uh, groups, missionary groups, missions groups. And they all have concluded that the, um, the harassment of Christians is on the increase. And actually today, uh, Christians are the number one religious group that are being persecuted throughout the world. 
Uh, Christians undergo harassment in 40, 145 out of 198 of the countries in the world, which is in, in, an increase of 50 countries uh, where Christians have undergo harassment and killings uh, from government and, and, and other, other groups. Uh, we just read just a couple of days ago in Nigeria, the Muslims came in at coming into a church and killing a bunch of people there. And that goes on pretty frequently there in that area of, of the world where the Muslims now from North Africa are trying to push down in the central and southern Africa. Their goal is to make Africa an entirely Muslim uh, continent. So we're seeing uh, an increase of verbal abuse and social harassment and physical violence and even killings of Christians. Uh, they're being increasing and re increasingly reported across the globe. And as I said, you know, make Christianity is now or Christians of uh, persecution of Christians is the, is the most common form of religion, uh, religious uh, persecution in the world today. Uh, <clears throat> the study uh, that I cite here uh, concluded uh, that, and I'm quoting here, in terms of the number of people involved, the gravity of the crimes committed and their impact, it is clear that the persecution of Christians is today worse than at any time in, in history. Again, in quote. So uh, the World Watch list of 2020 has recorded the same thing as, as uh, they have. Uh, open doors concluded from their uh, data that as of January 2020, Christian persecution around the globe has reached an unprecedented level with some 260 million Christians are now facing high levels of persecution. The article stated that uh, one in eight believers around the world suffer serious levels of persecution. And every single day, eight Christians are killed because of their faith, and 23 Christians are raped or sexually harassed because they are Christians. Meanwhile, every week, 182 Christian churches or buildings are being vandalized. 102 Christian homes, shops, or businesses are attacked, burned, or destroyed around the world. Uh, so the, uh, uh, and then I'm uh, quoting from Mark West, who uh, wrote an article uh, there about all of this. And he said, uh, I, I'm quoting and reading off of the slide here, note the amazing power of truth. Jesus was held by the authority of his day. Jesus spoke truth to Pilate. He spoke truth to power. The truth convicted and condemned the conscience of the one in authority and left him floundering for an equitable resolution. As we deal with authority issues in our day, we should have the same result. We should speak truth to power and allow the spirit of God to work through that truth. And so it is Jesus showed us how to respond to tyranny. Christians must resist the, the temptation to use politics, violence, or any other form of coercion to fight against dictators uh, or neighborhood thugs who hate us and, and attack us. Uh, our, like our master, we must never compromise the truth uh, uh, or uh, bow to the pressure to compromise or to give up on our, on our faith. You know, our kingdom and its rewards are not of this world. Therefore, it is not for us to revolt against evil governments of this world. We can only change one soul at a time by speaking the truth that by his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Whenever or wherever God may have placed us in government service, in the military, business, or work, we are called to be his light shining in the dark and to speak the truth, no matter what the personal cost may be to us. And so this is what we are learning from this particular chapter, but also from the entire story of, of the Gospels, how Jesus always spoke the truth in every situation where he was, no matter what the cost was. And we are to follow his example uh, in doing that. So, amen.